All right, welcome everyone to our first IBD brief session of 2024. Thanks for being here today. Um, we are going to start, so uh, as you all know, this program is funded by Pfizer. We're going to start with our hot topic today. Dr. Michael Dolinger is going to talk to us about the use of intestinal ultrasound in monitoring of IBD, which very cool new thing that we've been using a lot in our clinic and hopefully will be sort of widespread in the next several years. So, Mike, if you want to come on up here. Yes, it's, uh, it's become very popular. So I just uh, was running over from doing one, just fitting it at the last minute. Um, but this has been done for a long time uh, around the world and in Europe, and we're just starting to catch up, I think, on how to use this tool. But I think we have the advantage of being a little bit more, not to be controversial, experts in day-to-day -day IBD management and how to position this tool within care, which I think has been a question for a long time. And so one of the biggest concepts is that this is point of care. This is not an MRI. This is not a CT. The, the advantage to this, and the main advantage, is that you can get a point of care assessment in the clinic. And to have that valuable information added with accuracy trade-offs or not, it really does change the clinic visit. And this is the most useful point of care tool we have to date. And I think a lot of our tests are becoming point of care tool, but this is the first one we have. And this is how it's done. So I speak about it all the time now, but we are the first center to have done it. And really we have trained every other center. So this is Noah Cleveland in Chicago, who we helped train as the second center in the United States. And as you can see here, it's a point of care test. The patient lies on the exam table during the visit without preparation or fasting. We apply jelly just like any other ultrasound, and we're able to track bowel inflammation. And this is one of our patients here who has ileal inflammation. We're able to track 15 centimeters of ileal disease and say it's improving, it's active, it's chronic. We've responded to therapy or not right there in the visit within minutes. Um, really, really an effective tool for shared understanding between the patient and the provider all at the same time. And this is quick. We often have a trainee, so it slows things down, but in the hands of an expert, if it's normal, when you do the entire colon and small bowel, it takes less than three minutes, I would say. If there's inflammation, it takes about five to seven minutes, and if there's complications, it takes 10 to 20 minutes. But you move systematically for the same thing every time. You go sigmoid colon, descending colon, transverse colon, ascending colon, and then terminal ileum, where the patient has long-standing terminal ileal disease, we do the same approach. Again, a trainee may take 10 minutes to move around the colon and to get stuck in the left colon, but if you're doing it fast, you can do this in about 60 seconds. And you really can see the details of the bowel wall layers, especially when it's normal and it's one millimeter thick, but you can see here the haustral folds. You don't have to be an ultrasound expert to know the pattern of a colon. Uh, really, really great high resolution visualization. And I think it's important, something I, I learned with ultrasound really quick that you don't learn in gastroenterology training is you learn, and, and this may be with gnome and the layers of the bowel wall, but you really learn the layers and how they are so different in different patients. In that you can have a patient with a bowel wall thickness that you say MRI has thickening, enhancement, restricted diffusion, but when you see the thickness, it's more submucosal in one patient, and the same thickness could be more deep mucosa in another patient. It could be more muscularis propria in another patient. You get to get a sense that there is this range and spectrum of so many different inflammatory bowel diseases within the same patient, um, and that different wall layer contributions that you see on ultrasound as the only tool really actually make a difference in terms of response to therapy and how we think of chronic versus active inflammation. But the important measures are bowel wall thickness and bowel hyperemia. When you're seeing reports of ultrasound and you're seeing inflammation, you want to know what is the thickness, is there increased blood flow or not? Those are the two main things. And we measure from the lumen mucosal interface to the muscularis propria serosal interface. Uh, this is a nice figure from Jill Gregory. In theory, that's a nice concept, but actually when you're seeing inflammation, it's not so black and white all the time. You have this mixed picture. And here you can see on the right side, a longitudinal section of terminal ileum that has lost its stratification and layer pattern. You don't see that white, black, white, but it's still this inflamed kind of heterogeneous mess, but here you can see in cross-section a little bit also blurring of the layers, but they're still more composed. You see active Doppler flow, you see kind of that layer pattern, but it's the same inflammation in a different pattern. You see bright surrounding inflammatory fat. So while we look for the same things, it can really look different in different patients. And this is what it looks like when you're looking at it with a patient. You see this active, juicy, hot ileum 
you know you want to treat it and, and they know what they need to do. It's really an effective point of care tool to convince a patient to treat this effectively. And the same for colitis. What I tell patients who aren't responding to mycelomy is that this is a full thickness disease just like Crohn's disease. And when they see it, that it goes beyond the mucosa, they see the submucosal thickening. They, it just happened today. Uh, you know, they see the submucosal thickening, they see the hyperemia, they know they need to go to a more effective therapy that goes beyond the mucosal lining because their inflammation goes beyond the mucosa. And that connects with people. Um, what we have shown, so we've started to unearth the understanding at Sinai, which is really nice. We just had this paper published, uh, really understanding how ultrasound is very accurate for remission and very accurate for severe inflammation. But there's a large gray area that actually hasn't been unearthed. That how accurate is it for moderate inflammation? How could that be utilized today? And here we have in clinical trials, you have cutoffs for the SCSCD of six, a total SCSCD, or an ileal SCSCD of four. And actually, you could use ultrasound to reduce the screen failure rate, which is the number one reason we have patients who don't meet criteria for clinical trials, a 70% screen failure rate on colonoscopy, reduce unnecessary colonoscopies by doing an ultrasound first. Uh, really a cost-saving tool for both patients and uh, the pharmaceutical companies. And we show ultrasound is pretty much 85% accurate to ileal inflammation that would meet clinical trial enrollment. Um, and again, to have this done in minutes, you want a patient enrolled for a trial, we're doing this now, actually, and I see, oh, it's 3.3 millimeters thick. I'm actually not going to choose that patient as my trial patient because I don't think they're actually going to meet criteria and see. I think they need a little bit more inflammation uh, to subject them to a colonoscopy. So really helpful data. And then what we use it for the most clinically is following treatment response. So when you have a patient and you want to use ultrasound as a non-invasive tool to match it with an endoscopy or MR that you're doing at baseline and then follow this to know that it's accurate to the gold standard is really helpful. Again, not in replacement, but as that in-between point of care monitoring tool to help guide optimization and response. And what we showed in children, this was also just accepted, uh, that a basically a 20% decrease in thickness at week eight after starting any therapy in ileal Crohn's disease is almost completely predictive of endoscopic remission at treat to target. And that's a SCSED of zero, not less than three. Um, so really absence of ulceration uh, at almost 100%. And kids who don't need cancer screening, this could be a really valuable tool to actually avoid colonoscopies in this specific group. We use it for severe colitis, and actually it's very helpful in identifying patients who respond. And again, it's similar 20% thickness. You want to look for that decrease within the first 48 hours of starting any therapy. And then we have a lot of patients who don't fit in this bucket who it's helpful for. Post-surgical patients, you can really see recurrence really nicely. It's probably the hardest exam to do on ultrasound and takes longer, but you can characterize the anastomosis for most people and really follow the neoterminal ileum. This is severe inflammation. And then we have a lot of pregnant patients, and we really use this as a monitoring tool in our pregnant patients, and we have used this to guide therapy, including starting therapy, hospitalizing patients, and, and following their response. And this is a paper that Zoe published from a figure, uh, re really nice way to track the bowel wall during pregnancy in a non-invasive way. And then uh, one of the things that I'm most interested in at the current moment is following complications. So you can follow strictures, and you can see the luminal contents and the turbulent flow struggling to move through a strictured lumen. And to actually see that with a patient and say, oh, that's exactly where I feel my symptoms, it's actually a magical experience to watch that in real time on the screen and really uh, fascinating. And we have some research going on uh, to help use this to kind of characterize strictures in a completely new way and unearth maybe new mechanisms of IBD. So, we were the first center in the United States and not knowing if this would take off or we'd be the only center doing it. And now uh, 63 IBD experts in the USA have begun training. And there are more than 120 centers who have begun the process of training in the United States. Currently about 10 uh, have this fully in their clinic with at least one person doing it, but over 120 in the process, which is really exciting considering in 2019 there were zero. Um, and, and so we'll leave it at that. If I may, um, yeah. you know how much I value this, I'm <laughs> using you a lot to Something that we should measure is the uh, impact uh, on the knowledge of patients. I think it's that this ultrasound has even a psychological impact on the patients. It is improving the knowledge of the disease by our patients, which is super important. And I think we should do a study to measure that.
That is a great suggestion. Yeah. We are doing that study. Uh, we have a survey. Uh, yeah. We have combined it with Dartmouth uh, and Corey's group, who also does ultrasound. And we have enrolled over 200 patients already um, in the study. And we're going to present it at DDW, uh, the initial prelim results. Hopefully, it'll actually be published before then. But the exciting part is that it actually really helps with Crohn's disease knowledge yeah. patients and their decision making. It doesn't so far impact compare, and we did patients who get ultrasound driven care and those who have never had ultrasound driven care. Does it impact ulcerative colitis really? patients? And, and I think that makes sense when you think about it because you see patients usually have bleeding, they, they know they're inflamed. Mm -hmm. Crohn's these patients, when we're detecting inflammation, often have no symptoms or don't have any markers that are non invasive that we can follow. And so, uh, first time we've been able to show that and actually was surprising to me. I thought it'd be helpful for everyone as, <laughs> as I'm very excited, but it didn't make a difference for our UC patients in terms of their knowledge, satisfaction, decision making. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. I would agree that it is one of the most useful tools that we have and it has greatly changed my practice, especially with pregnant patients, but also just with all of my IBD patients. So thank you, Mike, for teaching me how to do ultrasound and also thank you for presenting this and teaching uh, our audience about it today.